Jesus was walking along a hot, dusty road. When we think of a road today, we think of a pavement. But for him, it was just a hot, dusty road. And wherever Jesus went, there was a crowd with him. Well, all of a sudden, Jesus gets under a tree. So you think, oh, great, he's probably found some shade. But he stops under this tree. He looks up, and there's a guy in the tree just right over where Jesus is about to walk. And Jesus said, hey, I see you, Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, you need to come down right now because I am hungry and I'm having lunch at your house today. Can you imagine if that happened to you? Wherever Jesus went, there's a crowd. So there's this whole crowd of people watching. And, and they're always wondering, what's Jesus going to do next? I, I, I think sometimes even his closest disciples are going, what's he going to do next? This was so, such a strange thing that the, the gospel writers, the people who wrote the story of Jesus in the Bible, they said, this weird thing happened. Jesus just goes, come down. I'm having lunch at your house today. Well, we think, okay, that's strange enough. Jesus just, with a bunch of people, he says, stop, you, come down, I'm, I'm, I'm having lunch. But all of a sudden, the crowd around him got ticked off. Like, it seems like a, you know, just kind of a neutral thing, I, I, I'm going to have lunch. But it was because of whose house it was. Zacchaeus was a guy who collected the taxes for the Roman government that was oppressing Israel. And Zacchaeus said, well, I see a way to just make a little side, a little something, something for myself. And so he would say, he would see on the tax roll, oh, you owe $1,000, but he would tell the person, you owe 1243. Here's pocket, 243. And he just got rich off of the people. And so everybody hated him. They knew that, they were, that he was stealing from them. They hated him. They, they, they just said, why would Jesus ever go to his house? But meanwhile, Zacchaeus is pumped. Wow, Jesus, this teacher that's doing miracles and teaching the crowds, he's come to my house. And so Zacchaeus called up everybody he knows. Uh, but he didn't do that. It was like, this how he called. Hey, everybody I know, come on over. Because it was slightly before cell phones. And they, they, everybody came over. But guess who came over? All the people that were like him. All the bad people. All the people with bad reputation. All the people that the general public did not like. They all came to his house. So there's Jesus. There's Zacchaeus. And all the bad people that he hung out with, all at his house. But the story is told in Luke chapter 19, verses 8 to 9. And in verse 8, this is what happened. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. So there's all this controversy swirling around this lunch. He stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and... If I have cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. So he's responding in the way the Jewish law would prescribe. He, so he's saying, I am going to make restitution for my theft. And listen to what Jesus responded back to him. He said, verse 9, salvation has come to this home today. For this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. How did he show it? Did he get down on his knees and pray? Did he um, uh, serve? Did he bring a sermon? Did he volunteer in the nursery? All those things are good. I've done many of those things. But the way this man showed he was a true son of Abraham, in other words, he, he showed that salvation had come to his heart, that he really was a part of God's people. The way he showed it is by the way he responded to Jesus in generosity. Really interesting that of all the signs Jesus could have looked for, he said, ah, that shows me his heart has changed. 
Because this man, who all he did and what he was famous for was taking, stealing, and, and robbing other people, he, his heart did a flip-flop, did what you call a flip-flop. I used to have a friend that said, that. his heart did what you call a flip-flop, and he started giving. And it, when he's talking about giving, first of all, I'm going to give half of everything I have to the poor, and then I'm going to give back four times of everything I've taken. So he's talking about emptying out himself for others as a response to his encounter with Jesus. It was a radical response. And we learn from his life that generosity flows out when Jesus comes in yeah. to your house. Yeah. Generosity flows out. It's, it's a natural thing. It just happens in the presence of the one who gave it all. We naturally give. Everything's stripped away, and we just go, oh, what's important is that I give. Yeah. And that happens when you're in the presence of the greatest giver of all time. Yeah. If, if you or I are not feeling generous, if, we, if, if you uh, don't naturally see a need and fill it, if you don't naturally participate in the kingdom of God financially, then perhaps what needs to happen is like Zacchaeus, you just need a fresh encounter with Jesus. Because if you get, have an encounter with Jesus and you receive his heart, his heart is to give. Yeah. And we can't help it when you encounter Jesus. You can tell I'm talking about encounter. And we're in a series of messages called encounter. Jesus invited you to encounter him. He said, come, be with me, learn from me. Take my yoke, take my ways upon you. Learn from me. I'm humble and gentle in heart, and I will give you rest for your souls. Jesus invites you into a lifestyle of encounter being with him, learning from him, hanging out from him, being changed, having your heart changed, laying down, down your anxieties and taking up his peace and his rest for your souls. And I want to invite you, I want to extend that invitation to you to encounter Jesus in a fresh way. Each week now, we've been looking at different ways you can get yourself into a, a position to encounter Jesus. There's things that you can do that get you there. But those things are not the goal. That's not the end game. The goal is to be the kind of person who encounters Jesus every day. Not just at, even at church. At church too, but every day. To be the kind of person that encounters Jesus. So those things that, that, that you can do, that helps. Let's do it. So, so let's do all of those things. We talked about being baptized. We talked about putting your faith in Jesus. We talked about being a part of the church and participating in the life of the church and communion. We talked about a bunch of different things you can do. Today I want to, to talk to you about is tithing for you? Is tithing for you? Tithing's a thing, and we're going to talk a little bit about it today, but is it for you? People say, that, there's this little phrase where they say, oh, I love that for you. <laughs> and what that means is I don't want to do it. I don't like that food. I don't like that thing. I don't like that job or whatever, but I love it for you. Oh, yeah, I think that's just awesome <laughs> for you. So I want to ask you today, is tithing for you? Can you encounter Jesus through tithing? Well, I know this, that tithing is a step of faith. And when you step out in faith, you encounter Jesus. That is where you encounter Jesus. It's when you take steps of faith. Tithing also makes your apprenticeship with Jesus an action adventure. <laughs> because you're actively participating, interacting with God. As, as you tithe. So we're going to talk about that today. One of our core values, I'm looking for it, it's, on, it's posted on the wall back, back there. We live generously. We live generously as a church. It's one of our, our seven core values. We believe that everything we have was given to us by God. So that's the starting point. Like that's our belief. And based on God's word, we believe everything we have was given to us by God. And so we honor God by giving back to him eagerly and willingly and joyfully, cheerfully. That's how we honor God. We give our time, talents, and treasure. We live generously towards God and towards his people and his purposes. So we as a church, we believe in tithing. But what is it? 
Tithing is simply giving the first part of your income back to the Lord. The tithe, that word means tenth. So it's just a, it's just a tenth. In any, that's what the word means. So like if you give a tenth of your cake, that's, you gave a tithe. If it, it's, it's a tenth. All right, but uh, is tithing really for today? Uh, and a lot of people wonder that. And is tithing really for you? Well, I, I've got several truths to, to, to bring to you today. And I encourage you to take notes. Take notes in your phone, in your journal, wherever you, wherever you would take notes. Use the back of a Connect card. Let, let's, let's take notes and let's, uh, I encourage you to do, to do that every day. Every time I'm in the congregation, someone's preaching, I take notes because you just retain more. And uh, you can, uh, I, I, I find the Lord will speak to you through it. So first of all, just a truth I want to share with you. Tithing is not for you to go back to the law of Moses. Tithing is not for you to go back to the law of Moses. In the New Testament, in Galatians 5, 18, it says that as a Christian, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Okay, so I want you to hear that. The Bible says you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. Okay, so we're not keeping those 600, over 600 commands in order to earn God's favor and be a part of the people of God. That's not, that's not what we're doing anymore. Hebrews 8, verses 7 to 13 says that God has replaced the old covenant that covenant of the law of Moses, with a new covenant. And God said, I've written it on your heart. It's a very personal covenant. Whereas in the Old Testament days, it was all about following a bunch of different rules, a lot of out of fear that you, wouldn't get, that, that you, you, you don't want to get struck down or something like that. And so out of, they, people, they, 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 obligate, they obligated themselves to follow the law, and they, they ended up following it out of fear a lot of times. But God said, that's never what I wanted. I'm, I'm, I'm replacing that covenant with a, with a personal covenant where you would know the Lord personally, not through a priest. And so you don't tithe. If, 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 you, if you have in your mind that I need to tithe to fulfill the law of Moses, that's not right. If you also have in mind, I'm not going to tithe because I'm not under the law of, law of Moses, that's also not right. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. There's one of the prophets in the Old Testament. Some say he's the Italian prophet, Malachi. <laughs> <laughs> but others, others call him Malachi. Anyway, so Malachi, this prophet, he prophesied that there is a way of living that displeases God. And it's a kind of a short book, maybe uh, I think four chapters, in, but he, he talks in there about several things that displease God, and he kind of confronted the people of God about it. He talked about vows, and he said breaking vows displeases God. And so Jesus deals with it in the New Testament. And he said, like, how about we just don't make a lot of those kind of vows? But there is a vow that Malachi talked about, the vow, the marriage vow. And he said that when you break that vow, that displeases God. He also talked about how if you bring sacrifices of God to God in, in worship, and you just say, God, you know God wants the best, but you bring your worst. Malachi confronted that, and he said that displeases God. Withholding the tithe displeases God. When you call an evil person or an evil thing good, that displeases God. And so Matthew, or Malachi just goes through all these things and he, he confronts the people of God about living in ways that displease God. So we know that tithing is one of those things in the same category as those others that it is a thing that pleases God. However, we're not under the law of Moses anymore. Do you know, though, that we are under another law that the New Testament talks about? Do you know what law that is? The law of, the law of Christ. And also that probably. But the one I'm going to highlight today is the law of Christ. And Paul talks about this in the Bible. What is the law of Christ? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, if you do that, you have fulfilled the whole Bible. Do you know that God, through the whole Bible, he is after one thing, relationship with you. 
God already loves you. And so he's saying, my people, would you please love me back? <laughs> and because you love me and I love you, love everybody as yourself. Yeah. Jesus said, if you do that, you're good. <laughs> like that's, that is really the whole point. So tithing is for you because you love God and love others. It's an expression of love. Okay, but it is not to go back under the law of Moses. You have no obligation as a Christian to be under the law of Moses. There are some things in the law of Moses, and there are different kind of categories of laws that seem to have survived the cross. Still today, you shall not murder. That's still a thing. And that was part of the law of Moses, but it, it, is, it is a universal law. It was not, the, it's not in the same category as don't eat scallops. Okay? It's a different category. And some of those things Jesus reaffirmed in the New Testament. In fact, what he did is he upped it. And uh, the, yeah, so, so some of those things did survive. But we're not going back to be under the law of Moses. So again, a second truth, tithing is not for you to earn God's favor or earthly rewards. Yeah. Now, God, uh, uh, tithing pleases God, and so he, he does pour out his favor. Uh, um, God does reward us for, for being his followers, for living uh, uh, according to his ways, but tithing is not for you to get. That's not the point of tithing. We don't give to get. We don't tithe to God to get. And certainly, tithing is not extra credit to make up for some sin in another area of your life. And already you're laughing, and that sounds so silly, but you know what? That is what the Pharisees did. And Jesus actually rebuked them for that. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus said, What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law and you Pharisees, you hypocrites? For you are so careful to tithe even the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the more important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Yes, you should tithe, you should tithe yes, but do not neglect the more important things. So Jesus is saying, listen, you don't just go sinning and say, I'm going to tithe to make up for it. That, that, is not, that is not what God is calling you. Tithing is not for you to do that. It's not to get from God, and it's not to cover up your sin or your, you're not following the, love, the law of Christ in other areas of your life. That is not what tithing is about. And I, as a pastor, I've known so many people over four decades of ministry, and some of them, some people have just flat out said to me, well, I wrote a check, so me and God are good. Oh my goodness, I do not want to be you on Judgment Day. Like, that is not, that is not what tithing is about. Tithing is not for you to do that. God loves you. God wants relationship with you. And so God gives you guidelines so that you know what pleases him. Pastor Shelley and I have guidelines for each other. <laughs> so we know um, that I don't really like that. Uh, so I'd rather you don't do that thing. And we know, uh, oh, I really appreciate it when you do that for me. So we know that, and those guidelines help us. But the guidelines aren't the point. And I don't, uh, I, I don't, you know, uh, put five pumps of sugar-free vanilla in her coffee <laughs> to earn her favor. <laughs> I do it because I love her. And I want her coffee to be just like she likes it. But I don't do it to earn her favor. And she would still love me even if I messed up. She would just say, hey, like, you don't need ten pumps. <laughs> Let's back that off a bit for tomorrow. All right, and that's the way it is with God. So God, God gives us his word. He's shown us the things that please him. But we don't do those things to get him to please us, you know, to be pleased. We just get, we do them because we love him. And he first loved us. And so we want to please him. Now that we know what he wants, we want to do it. All of God's commands are intended to bring you closer to him. That's the point. And so if God can help us to not do some stuff that offends him, that helps us be closer to him. 
If God can help us to do some stuff that does please him, that brings you closer to him. That's the whole point. And generosity flows out when Jesus comes in. That is just, it just happens. That is what happens. Tithing is not for you to earn God's favor. It is a result of God's favor in your life. Okay? Last thing. Tithing is a way for you to encounter Jesus. It is a way for you to encounter Jesus. I already talked about it. It's a step of faith. It is part of the action adventure. You're participating in the kingdom. You're participating in Jesus' work. It's a way to encounter Jesus. There's a story in the Old Testament uh, in Genesis chapter 28. Now, I, I, I want to give you the context of this. This is a story about Jacob, who, whom God later renamed Israel. So Israel is not even a nation yet. Okay, so this is Israel. Jacob is his, his. That was his first, his given name. Jacob, one man. This is a long. This is hundreds of years before Moses ever was born. Uh, uh, many hundreds of years. Okay, so way before the law. You've got to just get that in your mind. This is before the law. Now the context is Jacob had messed up. He had divided his family. His brother, twin brother, wanted to kill him, and he is leaving the family home. Uh, to go, uh, his original family home, to go be with some extended family. So he's, he's taken off. I, I get the impression that, uh, that he's by himself. I, I, I went back, I looked, I, I can't tell for sure, but I, I don't, it, at least in, in, when this story happened, he seems to be by himself. He finds a place to camp. So think before campgrounds, okay? He's just walking or maybe he's got a donkey or whatever and he's just, he's just setting out for his extended family. He's by himself at night. He finds a place to camp. He takes a stone and, and brings it over to use as a pillow. So I'm, I'm hoping like he put a, his coat over it or a blanket over it or something to soften it. But there, there he was using this pillow as a stone and God gives him a prophetic dream, and in this dream, it's so vivid that he, he is able to recount every detail. There he sees a stairway from earth to heaven with the angels of God going up and down on this stairway. Uh, a lot of our translations will say a ladder. Uh, I, I've read another scholar that talks about, oh, it's, it's, it's much more than that. It, it, it was probably more like a... Um, uh, what would have been an old-fashioned tower to, to worship God. So, like, it, it, is a, it is not just like a two-foot ladder that's barely big enough for you to get up and down. This is a stairway, a ladder to heaven that angels are able to go up and down on this ladder. Uh, and he sees us in the dream. Now, a little sidebar. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, Jesus tells us what the ladder is. Do you know what the ladder is? Jesus. Jesus is the stairway to heaven. He is, right? I know. And so then they wrote a song about him and everything. Yeah. Um, so the Lord spoke to Jacob, who was going to later be named Israel. The Lord spoke to Jacob in this dream. And he gives him the most amazing promises. He says, I am Yahweh, I am the Lord. This is in, in uh, Genesis chapter 28, starting in verse 13. I am the Lord, I am the God you've heard about from your, your uh, grandfather Abraham and your, your father Isaac. I am your God. And Jacob, the, la the ground you're lying on, I'm giving it to you and to all of your descendants. And he says, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through, you, through your family, through your descendants, Jacob. And we know that Jesus eventually comes through that family line. And he said, what's more, I am with you. I'm going to protect you wherever you go. One day I'm going to bring you back to this land. Remember, he's leaving that promised land, and he's, he's going to be with extended family. But God says, I'm going to bring you back here. I will not leave you until I have finished giving you everything I have promised you. So God, in this prophetic dream, renews the covenant that he had with Abraham and then with Isaac and now with Jacob. And he renews all that. And he, he just states it as such a beautiful promise to Jacob and his family. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to bring you back here. And then Jacob woke up from this dream and he says, Surely the Lord 
is in this place. It's one of my favorite songs right now by River Valley Worship. It just says that over and over again. Surely the Lord is in this place. Yes, he is. Oh, it came from this, from this encounter with the Lord. And he says, what an awesome place this is. And there's an old song when I was much younger. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. That's Jacob. That's, that's what he experienced. Like we're today, our worship is still inspired today by this encounter that he had with God. And so he renames the place. He said, I didn't realize this. This is Bethel. This is the house of God. God is here. And the, 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 that place was forever changed, now to be known as the, as the, the house of God. And Jacob takes that, that stone that he was laying on for a pillow, and he turns it into an altar. He poured olive oil all over it. And he says, this I am now setting up as a memorial stone that I'm going to remember this is where God spoke to me. This is where God revealed himself to me. This is where God spoke his promise and his blessing over me and all my descendants. What a beautiful, wonderful thing. And then I want to read to you Genesis chapter 28, starting at verse 20. Then Jacob made this vow to God. He said, if God will indeed be with me and protect me on this journey... So he's saying, if God is, is going to keep his promise, and if he will provide me with food and clothing, and if I return safely to my father's home, then the Lord will certainly be my God. And this memorial pillar I have set up will become a place for worshiping God, and I will present to God a tenth of everything he gives me. Jacob did not promise the Lord the tithe, the tenth of his income, to follow the law. Moses had not been born yet. Jacob said, Lord, I am so grateful for everything that you have promised me. And as I, as I receive all those blessings, I'm going to make sure that every one of those blessings I turn right back to you, Lord. And I'm going to do that by giving you the first tenth of everything you bless me with. Tithing is about worship. That's what tithing is. It is not about the law. It pleased God, so he wrote it into the law of Moses. But tithing is just simply the response of a grateful heart to God. Generosity flows out when Jesus comes in. So here's a couple things that happen when you tithe and you give the first 10% of your income to the Lord. When you tithe, just like Jacob, you rely on God as your source. So when you set out to tithe, when you purpose to tithe, you say, God, if you give me a job, if you give me income, I'm giving you the first 10%. Because I am recognizing that I would not have a job if I did not have a God. Yeah. I, do, I would not have breath in my lungs if I did not have a God. Amen. And so I acknowledge, Lord, everything you gave me, every skill, you sent me to school, you gave me uh, my upbringing, you gave me my breaks, you, you gave me this position. Everything I have is from you, Lord. And so if you give it to me, I'm giving you the first 10% back. It all came from you anyway. Yeah. And I'm going to do it in, in response to the fact that you're my source. Jacob said... Every, as you bless me, as you give me these things, I will give back to you 10%. That, that's just, that was the, he's, he is just probably weeping and jumping up and down and dancing that God has said all these beautiful promises are for you. And so to him, this was a generous, beautiful gift back to God. I'm giving you my, the first 10%, Lord. This was nothing legalistic about it. This was not a rule-based thing. This was just a spontaneous heart cry to God in gratefulness. And when you tithe, you express your gratitude to God. Yeah. Th that is what you do. You acknowledge him as your source, and you say, thank you, God. <laughs> thank you. Thank you that you gave it to me in the first place. We tithe to worship God. So tithing is kind of a benchmark, and I, I don't want it to be a legalistic thing, a fear thing. It, it's just not, it's not that. It's not a rule thing. I have tithed since I had income. So I, I'm thinking like since I was a, a, a sophomore, junior in high school, maybe even before I had odd jobs. But since I was a young man, I have tithed. 
long before I was a pastor, I tithed. My pastor taught me to tithe. I tithe. Uh, pastor Shelley and I, we tithe every single paycheck. But what about that one really hard time that we went through financial? We still tithe. That, this is a non-negotiable in the Wakefield household. This was a condition for marriage. <laughs> like, no wife of mine, not going to tithe. You know what I mean? Like, we, we tithe. We tithe, right? And, and she's saying, no husband of mine is not going to tithe. That's right. And you know what? We have never, in 34 years of marriage, we have never, never had a discussion, should we not tithe? It's, it's, if, we're, if we're short, we're going to take care of it some other way. We are not going to take care of it by saying, God, I'm, I'm going to withhold even what you've given me. No, no way, Jose, in our house, no way. We are grateful to God. We know we would not have a thing that we have without God. And so we, we willingly give it to God. We worshipfully give it to God. So it's a, it's a benchmark, but it's not a legalistic rule. So my goal has always been to get to 90% of our income. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> we have quite a ways to go for that. But we've given more than 10% for years because we are so grateful that we can. It's so amazing that we can participate in the kingdom of God. So tithing pleases the Lord. He sees it as an act of worship. He wrote it into the law of Moses. It happened before. It happened after. It happened in the New Testament. Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament devoted two whole chapters to generosity in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And we just see a bunch of New Testament principles of generosity in there. Like, like in uh, chapter 8, verse 2, it's not how much you give, that, uh, not how much you have to give that matters. So you might be a very poor person. What matters is your heart to give. It's your heart to to give. Uh, another principle, when you give God your tithe, you're giving him your whole self. Because what God wants is yourself. And I don't know if you've ever thought about it this way, but your money is what you exchange for your time. Have you ever thought about that? Well, I will give you an hour of my life and you give me my hourly wage. It is, it is one of those things that we've, we, we say the value of my life, of, this, of these eight hours at work or whatever, that is the money that I receive from that. It is a swap. So like we swap our life, our time, ourselves for money. And so money then becomes a representation of your life. It's like a tangible like, here God, I'm giving you my life. So as we give God the first 10%, your income represents your life. Paul said uh, of the Macedonian church, they, did, they, they were so poor, they had nothing to give, but they gave anyway. In verse 5, they even did more than we had hoped, for their first action was to give themselves to the Lord and to us, just as God wanted them to do. God wants you to give yourself to the Lord. That's what he's concerned about. Give yourself to the Lord, and your tithe is a representation of yourself. In verse 11, it says that proportional giving honors God. Give in proportion to what you what you received. If you received a lot, then give a, a, your portion of that's going to end up being bigger. Cheerful giving pleases God. In verse 12, he says, uh, whatever you give is acceptable if you give it eagerly. So again, if you give out of fear or just out of mere rule keeping, like that's not the heart that God's looking for. Uh, chapter 9, verse 5, I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Verse 7, you must each decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly or, or in response to pressure. So do not tithe in response to what you perceive as pressure from me today. I, I, I hope I, you don't even feel it because I don't feel any pressure coming out of me to pressure you to tithe. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I want you to encounter Jesus. And one way to do that is through the tithe. And then, and then finally, another, a principle I see from Paul. Everything you have comes from God. He just reiterates what Jason knew, oh, uh, what um, Jacob knew. <laughs> my friend Jason just went whoop, right into my mind. Um, he reiterated what Jacob knew, and that is that everything comes from God. In uh, 
uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 and 11. God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources, then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. See, everything just comes from God anyway. It's just a joy to participate in his kingdom. And one way to do that, one way to encounter Jesus is through the tithe. We practice the tithe as worship. Would you stand to your feet, everybody? And would you bow your heads with me? Now, I've been talking a lot about tithing today. It was just, you know, it's a, it's a message on tithing. So that, that was the topic. But before I address that, I want to go back to something Paul said. And I want to invite you to give yourself to God. Yourself, your whole self to God. I don't know if you've ever done that before, or, or maybe you've kind of wandered away from God. Maybe you've just been doing your own thing. Maybe you just kind of think, well, my life is mine. I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made woman. But I hope you see today God is your creator. God is your source, and he wants you he loves you. He wants a relationship with you. So how do, how, do, how, do you, how do you give yourself to God? You put your faith in Jesus to save you. How do you do that? Turn away from your sins. Turn your life over to Jesus and let him lead you. And become a Christian. Become his apprentice. Give your whole self to God. So I want to invite you, if you've not done that, or if today is your day, to come back to Jesus and give him your life. With every head bowed right now, would you just raise your hand and say, a raised hand says, Pastor, I want to become a Christian today. I want to give my life to Jesus and put my faith in him to save me. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Online, would you also raise your hand to God right where you are? He can see you. He knows where you are, and he will see your hand if you give yourself to God. So I would love to just lead you in a prayer, coach you in a prayer to give your life to God. And church, would you just help me pray with all those who are praying today? Would you pray this out loud? Pray it to God. Let's go. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you and let you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And if you just put your faith in Jesus, hallelujah, that is amazing. That is awesome. Your next step is the following Jesus course. And you can see Pastor Christian in the lobby after the service, and we'll tell you more about it online. We've got the information for you there too. Following Jesus, that's your next step. Now for everybody else, I don't know if you've noticed, but this whole day, this whole service from beginning to end, we've been talking about, singing about, praying about, preaching about, giving yourself to Jesus, surrendering your life to him. And I've, I've kind of zoned in, you know, honed in on one, one aspect of it, uh, of the tithe. And, and that, is, that is just a very tangible, concrete way to surrender. And so what I'd love to do today is just to invite you to take a step of surrender. And I want to invite you to the front of the church to, to just pray and re-surrender your life to God. Now, if you are already a tither, would you step out first right now and just lead the way? Uh, because you're, you're already demonstrating that you are surrendering your life. But as even if you're already a tither, would you re-surrender and would you just resurrender everything that you've got, everything, and acknowledge the fact that God is your source? And then everybody else, whether or not you're a tither yet, I want to encourage you to give yourself to God. And so some of you today, maybe step forward. There's lots of people coming. This is awesome. Um, I encourage you to, if you have not yet begun to tithe, I encourage you to encounter Jesus in this way, to give him the first 10% of your income, and, and uh, do it as a, an act of worship and gratefulness to him. So what we're doing now is simply surrendering everything you have, everything you are, to Jesus afresh. It's a renewal. Just like God renewed his covenant with Jacob, 
let's us today, let's renew it. Lord, I'm renewing today the fact that you can have it all. I surrender it all to you. I'm renewing. So in your own words, we'll sing a little bit, that simple song, and you can use that as a surrender. But let's pray. Let's surrender everything. If you're already a tither, renew that. If you're not yet a tither, say, I'm ready to start, Lord, and just give it all to you. Let's do it. Let's worship together. Let's pray. Yes, Lord, it is now you. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe on. This heart that is. Lord, so I, I, I give you my car, I give you my house, my clothes, my food, all those things that I put my in front of, my finances, my checkbook, my savings, my retirement. Lord, I give it all to you, Lord God. I surrender everything I am. I surrender my family. I surrender our church, our city, our place to live. Lord, I surrender everything to you, Lord, for you, for your glory, for your kingdom, Lord. You gave us every one of those things. I surrender the breath in my lungs to you, Lord, so that I would be able to speak your words of encouragement to people and, and to do your will, Lord. I surrender my body. You gave me health, the ability to stay and use my hands and, and work and move. Lord, I surrender my body to you. I surrender my whole self as an act of worship. And Lord, to get today, Lord, as your church, we surrender all to you, Lord. We surrender all. You can have it all. Take it all, Lord. You can have it all. You gave it to us in the first place, Lord God. The, 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 the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No matter what, Lord, blessed be your name, Lord. We love you. Lord, I thank you for everything that we have. We really are a very, very blessed people. Even the poorest among us are very blessed compared to the rest of the world. So, Lord, we all have so much to be thankful for, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the food that we're going to eat today, Lord. Thank you because you gave it to us, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We surrender all. We're surrendered. We, we lay our lives on the altar to you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for every tither, and I know many of our tithers, just like us, we give way more than 10%. Lord, I pray your blessing, Lord. I pray for every person that stretches to give, Lord, I pray that you would just give them more to give, that you are the one who gives seed for the farmer. It all comes from you, Lord God, and I praise you, Lord. Lord, for the people that today are saying, wow, I've never been a tither. Maybe some of them have been givers, and they give some but they haven't been proportional in the giving. They haven't um, stepped out in faith in giving. Lord, I pray that today they would step out in faith and bring the tithe to you, not as a rule, but as an act of worship. And Lord, I pray you would meet us right where we are, Lord God. And I pray your blessing on all of our finances. Lord, we've surrendered it to you now. Now I pray for your blessing on it. In Jesus' name and for your glory, Lord. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, at this time, we'll dismiss our service. I love how Pastor Garen said that tithing is worship, and it really is. Like, we look back at the beginning of the Bible, it's like putting something on the altar. It's giving up something. 
That's what tithing is. So I just encourage you with that this week. Give to the Lord. See what he does. Not because of the blessing, but because he has blessed you. Amen? That's right. All right. At this time, if you filled out that Connect card, please leave it on your seats, and the ushers will collect it. God bless you. We love you. Have a good one.